Our new unit is on the human body systems. And in chapter 14, we're going to look at three systems. Lesson one is on the skeletal. Lesson two is on muscle. And then lesson three is on the integumentary system, which is skin. And our lesson one, we're going to have two parts. And this is actually the first part of lesson one. The big idea is uh, what you need to be able to answer and understand after we finish all of the lessons. So when we look at all three of those systems, how do your bones, your muscles, and your skin help maintain the body's homeostasis? Now remember what homeostasis is? That internal balance inside of you. The key concepts we will cover in part one and part two. What does the skeletal system do? How do the parts of the skeletal system work together? And how does the skeletal system interact with other body systems? So some stats that you need to know. The human skeleton, as an adult, has 200, about 206 bones. So there's 206 separate bones. But when you were born, you had approximately 300. So imagine, and try to bring this up in class the next tomorrow, uh, why? Why do you think we had 300 bones, now we have 206? What happened to them? If you want to know how much your bones weigh, your bones account for approximately one-fifth of your body weight. So you would take your body weight and either multiply it by 0.2 or divide it by 5, and that would give you the weight of your bones. One thing you need to realize, when you see a bone like out on a pasture that's been la laying there for a while, or you look at the bones that I have in my class, those look like they're dead and nothing alive about them. That's because they have been dead and all the living material has decayed. But when a bone is inside the organism, that bone is a living organ. It has blood vessels, it has nerves, it has fatty tissue, it has red bone marrow, yellow bone marrow, which are the blood cell forming tissues, actually the red bone marrow is. Whenever we study a um, system, it's important to know why God put it there and what it does for us. So it's important to be able to list the functions of the skeleton. There's support, movement, protection, storage, and production. In support, imagine, uh, actually there's two kinds of support systems that God created. There are insects, like a beetle, that has an external skeleton, and it has some disadvantages to it. And then there's internal skeletons, such as animals and we have. And the skeletal system serves for a framework for support, holding all those things together. Uh, imagine if you didn't have one, you would be more like a jellyfish, a blob. You'd have some movement, or you could be like a worm. It doesn't have a skeletal system, but it does have some movement because of the muscles that it has. So bones provide support that helps you to sit up, helps you to stand, helps you to move along with the muscular system. Remember, we're trying to see how they interact. So here's a good interaction. The muscle system along with the skeletal system, they're both working together to move your body. One by itself is not going to do the job of the type of movement that we have. It takes both. And the bones are like the lever in a system, and the muscles are what are moving the levers. And we'll learn how the muscles move it when we get into lesson two. The bones are protection. So you need to know what bones protect what. The cranium, which is your skull, it protects your brain, also protects part of your eyes, and it protects your inner ear. The ribs are protecting your heart and your lungs. And your vertebral column is your backbone, is protecting the spinal cord inside of it. So two of the major parts of our central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, are enclosed in protective bone. And then you think of your heart and your lungs, major. Storage, there are two things that are stored, minerals and fat. 
And there's two kinds of minerals, calcium and phosphorus. Now, when your body needs calcium or it needs phosphorus or it needs the fat, it then will be released from your bones and go into your blood and go to where it's needed. But it's also important that you're getting this in your diet because if you don't get enough in your diet, then your body can't store it. You won't have any extra. And if you can't store it, then your body is going to still need it and it's going to keep depleting it out of your bones and that causes some diseases like osteoporosis. The fat, of course, is energy. We studied about fat and the fat molecules and one of the places it's stored in is in the yellow bone marrow, which we'll get into. What does it produce? Bone marrow. The red bone marrow makes blood cells. It makes your red blood cells. It makes platelets, which, which are important in your blood, which we'll talk about when we get to the circulatory system. And as I was saying, it's a living organ. It's living tissue. And there's two kinds of living tissue that make up our skeleton, well, the bone part of our skeleton, and that's compact and spongy bone. And we're going to learn where they're located, what they look like, and what they do. First of all, on our major bones, our big bones, uh, God put a protective covering around them. And it's for a twofold purpose that we'll see. So the bone surface is covered with a layer of dense white fibrous tissue. It's called a periosteum. Peri means around, like perimeter, around. Osteum, whenever you hear the word osteo, osteum, it has something to do with bone. And the twofold purpose that God put it there is it's a place where the muscles can attach so that we can have the movement. And it's also for bone growth whenever you're growing and it's for repair. So that's the importance of this periosteum. Here's a good picture of the periosteum that they're pulling back off of your skull. Not your skull, but off of a human skull. And so your skull has that periosteum and the other bones covering it. And you can see how it's all pinkish and red. Well, that's the blood vessels that are supplying and going into the bone. So the, this thin tissue contains blood vessels and nerves as well as cells that produce no, new bone tissue. So it nourishes the bones, helps them function and grow properly, and it also helps them to heal after injury. The structure of bone, the hard outer portion of the bones is made of a dense web of fiber that's called compact bone. And um, if, if you look at the bones in my room, when you take that femur and you hold it like a barbell, that middle, that's that compact bone. Then if you look at the very end, some of it has been chipped off. Some of the compact bone has been chipped off. And you'll be able to see at the end the small holes. And that is called spongy bone. And it's called spongy because it resembles all the little holes in a sponge. Now, it's not soft and squishy like a sponge. And if you look at the lower right-hand picture, that's how the spongy bone, and see all those spaces? When that bone is alive in a living tissue, there's red bone marrow in those spaces. We'll see more of what the compact bone looks like when we get to the osteon, because that's what it is made up of. Inside most bones, it contains red bone marrow and yellow. The red is found in the spongy ends, as I said, of long bones and in some flat bones like your ribs. It's a tissue where the red blood cells are made and also platelets are made there. And so that's the function of the red bone marrow and it's red because of the blood cells that it's making. The yellow bone marrow is yellow because it's for fat storage and the color of the fat is yellow. And it too is found in the longest part of the bones. And one of the longest parts, if you know, in a big bone, you've got the knobs at the end, and then you have this shaft. And in that shaft, in that middle, if you were to look inside, if we could cut that bone in half, you would see a cavity in there called the marrow cavity or marrow cavity. And it is filled with red bone marrow except towards the end where the uh, 
knobs are. Then there's some yellow there. So the red bone marrow is a soft tissue that produces blood cells. It's located in the marrow cavity of long bones and in the spaces of spongy bone. In young people, this cavity is filled mostly with red bone marrow, a soft tissue that produces red blood cells and certain other blood cells, and that's the platelets. May, you make approximately, your red uh, bone marrow makes approximately a billion new blood cells every single day. You see that dark brown area, that's where it is, because when blood, when it, you have a lot of blood and you have it dried, that's the color that it looks like. The yellow, which stores fat, that's why it's yellow, it's going to be found inside the longest part, but towards the end where those knobs are. And as a person ages, the yellow is gradually going to replace the red. Now, it doesn't replace it completely. I think they say it can go up to like half. And then also, if your body then needs more blood cells, it can revert back to red uh, marrow. Here's the insides. So I said if we had a freshly cut, and we don't, but here's a good picture of it. If you look on the left there, you'll see the knobs where you can see the spongy bone. Then you can see the cavity, which is kind of pinkish, orangish, brown there. And then on either side of the cavity is where you have compact bone, which surrounds that whole cavity when it's not cut open. And whenever you have a ham bone, if you look at that upper right hand picture, like a ham bone, You've got the bony part, that's the compact, that surrounds the whole outside, that's the compact bone. And then that squishy stuff that's in the middle, that is actually the marrow, the bone marrow. And then here you have a good picture of two freshly cut, or one freshly cut cow bone, where you can see the spongy bone having a bunch of red blood cells, or the red bone marrow, and also the cavity there. Now, what holds our bones and our muscles together to help move the skeleton? And that is ligaments and tendons. They both are flexible bands of connective tissue. They're connective tissue. So that means their job is to connect. So the key is to know what they connect. Ligaments connect bone to bone. So whenever a bone is connected to a bone, it is by a ligament. Tendons connect bone and muscle. So whenever a muscle is attached to a bone at the periosteum, it's attached there. And it's usually a white, dense cord looking. And if you look at that muscle there on the right, look down and you see that white area, that's illustrating the tendon. It also, tendons connect muscle to muscle when there's not a bone involved. There's two main types of tissue that make up our skeleton. Now, some animals, uh, like a shark, their, inter their internal skeleton is all cartilage, and it stays our cartilage. Now, remember, before we're born, ours is all cartilage. But as we are born and start growing, it's replaced to bone, most of it. So bone consists of living bone cells. They're called osteocytes. And the non-living material that they secrete is known as a matrix. It has a more technical name, but we will refer to it as the matrix. Cartilage is a flexible supporting tissue. Blood vessels never pass through cartilage. Cartilage is a good place, you know, in your nose. If you go to the tip of your nose, you have flexibility. It's still rigid and hard, but you have flexibility. You can move it from side to side. But if you go back further, when you get closer to your eyes and you fill your nose, the bridge of your nose, that is bone, and that is not flexible. So right in your nose, you have a good example of both bone and cartilage. Some other places that you find cartilage is in the joints. God put cartilage around the ends of your bones so that it can prevent those bones from rubbing against each other and causing damage and well friction which causes damage and so imagine if you had bone moving like in your knee every day all the movement the bone rubbing against bone all the damage that would be done now god put some other things there too besides cartilage and we'll learn about that when we get into the joints which is in part two now, as I said, that compact bone, 
that hard, solid bone is made up of what we call osteons. And this is when you look at compact bone under a microscope. This is what you would see. Now, if it's stained, you're going to see orange, yellow, green, depending upon what kind of stain was used. To me, it resembles like a solar system. That's what I think of it. And you look in the middle of the solar system, you have that dark, bigger hole. That's actually called the central canal, or some books will call it the haversion canal. The haversion canal is where the blood vessels were housed, and it's also where the nerves, how the nerves also moved, because your living bone has nerves and blood vessels. The little looks like little tiny planets orbiting. They're kind of um, oblonged, and they're dark. Those are empty spaces now because it's dead, but what was in there when it was living and had living material, that's where all the bone cells. And a bone cell is called an osteocyte. So an osteocyte's a bone cell. And of course, that blood vessel is bringing the nutrients to, and see how the system's working together? Blood, bone. And then the non-living part, which would be the kind of the whitish, grayish part around it is matrix. Here's another example showing you, I like this diagram because it's showing you the nerves and the blood vessels and how they move through those central canals, through the haversion canals. And then you can also see at the very end the part that is spongy. So these osteons do not make up the spongy bone. They only make up the compact bone. And here's another good picture showing you the labeling of an osteon. And it's showing you that one of these solar systems, what it looks like, is an osteon. So bone tissue is made up of thousands of them. And we'll look at them under the microscope uh, when we do lab. The structure of bones. Now, the long bones in children and in young teens, you have what is called a growth plate. So obviously, that's an area of growth. It's how your bones grow longer. And it's actually a cartilage growth plate. So it's, that's cartilage again. So your skeleton used to be all cartilage. Now you just have cartilage at the end and on the growth plate. And that's what produces new bone cells in order to grow. And if you look on the x-ray on the right there, that circle is where you can see the growth plate. And hopefully you can picture it above, too, and the bone above that. Now here's showing you about birth. So before birth, your skeleton inside, as you were developing, was cartilage. And then you got some blood vessels, and it started to develop. And then you're born, and in infancy, it's developing more spongy bone and, and hard, compact bone, till eventually you reach adolescence, where you are now. And now you have just the cartilage in the areas that are called your growth plates. OK, let's talk about when you injure. When you break a bone or break bone tissue, I mean, or break a cartilage tissue, that's called a fracture. So it's called a bone fracture. And they are classified in two different ways. One is by the cause. The other is by the nature. And we're going to look at each of these. Cause is either traumatic or spontaneous. Traumatic doesn't have to look like this, you know, because that does look traumatic. Uh, you might not even know that your bone is broken um, because it might be a small fracture. But the key about traumatic is not how it looks and how bad it is, it's if it was caused by an injury. So if you broke your bone because of an injury, it's called a traumatic fracture. And you might think, well, what else could damage a bone if it's not an injury. Well, spontaneous fractures are caused by disease, like osteoporosis, like bone cancer. And so there can be the bones breaking because of a disease. That's spontaneous. Now let, let's look at the nature. What happens? There's compound and simple. And they're like, you either have one or the other. Compound is when the actual bone breaks the skin. And it's more susceptible, obviously, to infection because it's exposed then 
and doesn't have the skin barrier to protect it. If it's not protruding through the skin, it didn't break the skin, then it's called a simple fracture. So simple fracture doesn't go through the skin, compound fracture goes through the skin. So every fracture you have is either traumatic or spontaneous. Every fracture you have is either compound or simple. Every fracture is going to be complete or incomplete. Complete, by the words themselves, should, it should be able to give you the idea of what it has to do with. A complete fracture is when the break goes from one side of the bone and all the way through to the other side. That's a complete. If it only goes partially through the bone, doesn't go completely from one side to the other, that's called an incomplete fracture. It's more commonly referred to as a hairline fracture. So if you've heard of that, that's an incomplete fracture. Now these others are not, they're special cases. A comminuted fracture is when the bone actually is splintered. And you can see the several splinters there of that bone. That's the femur. Green stick is when one side of the bone is fractured. So that would be a what? Incomplete hairline. But the other side of the bone starts bending. And they get it from the green stick that outside, if the stick has green living material, you can bend it. If you have a dead stick, it snaps and breaks very easily. Green stick doesn't. It's really hard. You just bend it. And then impacted is what it says. The bone fragments are forced one into another. And you can see some of the hand bones there being forced in where the break was. Now the repair of bone fractures, unlike most body tissues, our bones actually heal with their own cells from periosteum, <clears throat> also growth plates. And it doesn't make scar tissue, like if you get cut on your skin, where it heals, you have scar tissue. The treatment is twofold. One is, first of all, it's got to be put back into the proper alignment. And of course, you saw that if it's protruding through the skin or if it has fragments. Sometimes that actually requires plates and screws to get it back into the proper alignment and also to immobilize it. And they can use the wiring kind of cast or they can use you know the common plaster kind of cast to immobilize it. But you have to set it first in the right alignment, then you have to keep it in that right alignment, immobilize it, so that it can heal on its own. And over time, it does. 